we begin the course with a long section on political theory. That is to say, we are interested here in the philosophies and the motivating ideas that underwrite political action. The philosophers we are investigating in this section of the course represent different, sometimes sharply antagonistic, trends of thought that culminated in our world. But one thing they all have in common is that they developed their ideas in response to the experience of living through traumatic periods of historical change. Aristotle's life is our first example. Born in a Greek city under the rule of the king of Macedon, Aristotle studied and taught at Plato's famous academy in Athens before becoming the personal tutor to Alexander the Great, future king of Macedon, conqueror of the Persian Empire, and the man most directly responsible for the transformative surge of Greek culture into the ancient societies of the Middle East, which we call Hellenistic civilization. Aristotle, along with Socrates and Plato, is one of the three most renowned philosophers of the ancient Greek world, whose work profoundly shaped the development of societies from Ireland to India. He wrote about everything, which is not just hyperbole. His books cover metaphysics, ethics, politics, biology, geometry, mythology, dreams, the structure of the universe, and on and on. We are interested here in the politics. This book is actually a set of lecture notes, like most of the books of Aristotle's we read today. The books he published during his lifetime more than 2,000 years ago have, by a series of historical quirks, all been lost. The politics, and with it our English word politics, is a translation of the Greek politike, which means the things related to the polis. Now, polis is a very important word. We usually translate it as city-state, referring to the typical classical Greek political form of an independent, self-governing city that ruled only the territory immediately surrounding it. The polis was this, and more. It was not just a government, though it was that, and it was not just a community, though it was that also. The typical polis was small, composing between 10 and 20,000 people. The few outliers, like Athens, were much bigger, up to 200,000 in some periods, but still small by modern standards. And of these several thousand people, the politically relevant population was much smaller. Women, slaves, and immigrants were totally excluded from political decision-making. In most cities, the class of men able to afford weaponry and mobilize for the regular wars fought by the different poli possessed political rights. In a democratic polis, like Athens, all free male citizens might have access to power, while the small oligarchy that ruled the polis of Thebes hoarded power among a tiny clique of wealthy landowners. No matter what regime prevailed in a polis, it had to count on its citizen army to defend the city and its interest. In a violent world of predatory states, the customary fate for a conquered city was its total destruction, the killing of its men and the enslavement of its women and children. Thus, in order to survive, a polis had to be a highly cohesive society in which all political rights existed alongside imperatives to duty and obligation to the city. This is one reason why politics and religion were entirely intertwined in the polis. Greek religion provided a unifying force of shared ritual and worship that tied the people of the city together and helps explain why even very restrictive, closed political regimes often ruled successfully. In some cases, religious community provided a level of solidarity that made broader access to political power irrelevant. So when Aristotle talks about politics, for that matter when we talk about politics, we are referring to those facts and events of life that by their nature are a common concern, that affect all members of a given polis or political society. The politics was written, scholars think, in the city of Athens. Athens was at one time the dominant polis in Greece, thanks to its naval empire and the prestige it won for its role in defeating the Persian invasion of the 490s BC. Athens' power was complemented by its political regime, what the Greeks called a democracy, or demokratia. The suffix kratia, or krasi, refers to ruling, or having power over. Literally, it means strength. Demos means the people, but in a very particular sense. It doesn't mean all of the people who compose the city. Rather, demos is the word that refers to those people in a polis who don't have any other defining status. They are not aristocrats, they are not warriors or priests, but they're not foreigners or outsiders. They were just the common people, the part of the city that was defined by the fact that it had no part to play. 
Now, this is, of course, untrue, because all of the drudgery of daily work in the ancient world, the work that kept the polis together, that grew its food and drew its water and sailed its ships, was done by the demos. Athens was just the most successful example of a polis in which, through a series of revolutionary upheavals, the common people had forced aside ruling kings, aristocrats, or tyrants, and secured a share of power in the business of the city. But, when Aristotle was writing the politics in the 330s BC, Athens was an occupied city under Macedonian rule. Its imperial heyday was long gone, and following defeats and wars with Sparta and Macedon, Athens lost its independence, though not its cultural prestige. But by losing its independence, it lost the crucial animating spirit of the polis. Athens would continue to exist as a city, but it would never again possess every factor needed to be a true polis. So we must keep in mind that as Aristotle offers us a densely argued, impeccably logical account of the nature of the polis, he is talking about a political form that was already dead. What we are reading is a kind of dissection. But we dissect in order to learn, in order to map a thing in death so that we can better understand its life. With that in mind, let's begin at the beginning. Now, Aristotle took for granted the Greek idea that all life has a telos the particular goal or fulfillment of life that is unique to each species. The telos of an acorn, for example, is to grow into an oak tree. That is its purpose. It is the one thing an acorn can do. But the acorn is also the only living thing that can achieve that end. Humans, too, are just one other kind of animal, one more species of life, so they, too, have a telos. Aristotle says that the telos of human beings is to live in the polis. Not in the wild, not in villages, not in empires, but in the polis. The reason for this is not that human beings can't live under other conditions, since they plainly do, but they can never live what Aristotle calls the good life. They can never achieve their highest potential if they are outside of the polis. Well, you might say, why not? What about the polis is uniquely suited to provide the good life? What is the good life, exactly? The good life is a life lived to its fullest human potential, one in which the opportunities to develop virtue and overcome vices are abundant. In this sense, it is the human telos, the completed state of being, that only humans can achieve. And the reason why only humans can achieve this good life is because only humans have the power of language. For Aristotle, language is the vehicle through which human beings pursue the good life, their own unique telos. Language is what makes it possible to communicate with one another fully. It is through language that we define ourselves, explain our actions, and give reasons for our beliefs. It is what makes possible the uniquely human faculty for reason, the ability to form judgments and interpret the world through the use of logic. Keep in mind the importance of language here. It's not just crucial to understanding Aristotle's point of view, but it's also an early expression of an idea that becomes central in recent political philosophy. The idea that the sense of reality we share is a joint construction made by language, and hence that language is a potent source of political power. Because humans alone possess these two qualities, Aristotle defines the human race as zuon politikon, the political animal that fulfills its nature, that achieves its telos, by living in a political community of equals. Aristotle understands equality in a very specific way here. As I mentioned, women, foreigners, and children were excluded from the political community in all poli. The Greeks took these exclusions for granted, and instead focused on distinctions between those men that made up the citizenry. The sharp divisions of wealth and status among citizens were also taken for granted. For Aristotle, the idea of equality was strictly limited to access to public power, to a voice in deciding the course of the polis. This formal political equality, the right to take part in the business of the polis, is absolutely crucial to Aristotle's argument that only the polis secures the possibility of the good life. The polis is the complete expression of the human instinct for association, which is another way of saying social life. Humans share this instinct with many other animals, from wolves to ants. For humans, the compelling need to live together is the basic urge that pushes us toward full development. 
The idea of the relation between instinct and development appears in lots of subsequent political thought, and we'll see versions of it in Rousseau, Marx, and Nietzsche. For Aristotle, the need to associate proceeds through specific stages, each of greater complexity. The primal association is sexual intercourse, which generates children and thus the family. The growth of the family generates the household, which here is a translation of Aristotle's Greek word oikos. Oikos is another important word. It simultaneously refers to an extended family and an economic unit. That is, the oikos referred to a self-sufficient family and its property. For the Greeks, as well as many other Mediterranean peoples, the oikos was the fundamental unit of society, its most obvious building block. In fact, English and many other languages derive their word for economy from oikonomia, the management of the household. The family that possessed an oikos was understood by Aristotle to be an absolute despotism, in which a patriarch exercised total control over the women, children, and subordinate men in the household. This control was as absolute as his control over the household slaves, who were counted among the property of the oikos, along with a house, herds of sheep, orchards, and so on. Here, Aristotle is expressing an assumption common to many societies of the ancient world, that within his household, a free man exercised absolute domination that could not be challenged. Echoes of this belief linger today, not least in the immense difficulty in securing effective laws against spousal and child abuse. This kind of domination is entirely non-political in Aristotle's terms. This means that the life of the oikos has no space for political life, and hence cannot secure the good life. But the oikos is still a necessary precondition for the good life, because the work of the oikos was to produce the basic needs of life. Self-sufficiency means the oikos produced the food, shelter, clothing, and tools needed for settled life. This work was done by the family and its slaves, if any, under the rule of the patriarch. Without this work, no society more complex than that of hunter-gatherers, those wild people shunned by the Greeks as clanless, lawless, and hearthless, could be sustained. The oikos sustains the conditions for mere life by which I mean a life in which basic necessities can be secured, but no further individual or social development can occur. Think back to the oak tree metaphor earlier. Imagine the oikos to be a young tree that might continue to grow and expand, but in its current state is vulnerable and underdeveloped. The association of households, and with it the association of free, independent patriarchs, created the life of the village. Aristotle saw village life as another vehicle for mere life, in which communal life solved common problems and eliminated some hardships of oikos life, but still did not call for living politically. In fact, Aristotle thought that life in the oikos and the village could go on just fine without the use of any language at all. The polis rises above these simpler states because, for one thing, the polis must be substantially bigger than a village and so bring together a more diverse population. This concentration of population creates space for more advanced crafts, arts, and social and religious complexity. And it is out of this matrix of increasingly complex social activity that the concept of a public life emerges. That is, a form of life separate from the oikos, in which otherwise unequal men come together as peers to decide the questions that concern the entire community. To create consensus out of so many diverse interests requires the intensive use of language, to make plans and propose projects, to give reasons and defend claims, to win personal distinction and shape the fate of the community. This practice constitutes Aristotle's good life, because it appears to him to be the fullest, most creative use of unique human qualities. Finally, a word on Aristotle's comments on slavery. Aristotle's understanding of slavery as an institution was entirely in line with the attitudes of the ancient Mediterranean. While slavery in Greece was never as widespread and fundamental to the socio-economic order as it was under the Roman Empire, Greeks readily accepted the idea that slavery was an appropriate and natural human condition. It is important to keep in mind that ancient slavery was not defined by a racial caste system. Racialized slavery is overwhelmingly a phenomenon of modernity, beginning with the European invasion of the Americas. 
There was no ancient concept that slavery was appropriate only for some people defined on the basis of race. Instead, almost anyone could find themselves in a state of slavery. But for Aristotle, the initial impulse toward the creation of master-slave relationships involves individual dispositions to rule or to be ruled. That is, some people are driven to rule, to impose themselves and their needs over others by whatever means necessary. Some people resist this imposition, or flee from it, or are destroyed by it. Others accept it and tolerate life as the object of someone else's will. For Aristotle, a slave is someone willing to trade freedom for life. The price of this is to lose one's individuality and become a kind of living tool, whose existence was legally defined as an extension of the master's will. Now, here we see an example of Aristotle devoting serious intellectual attention to rationalizing an institution whose existence creates tension with any philosophy of freedom. It is not so very different from modern defenses of slavery, including those in the antebellum United States. When we read Aristotle, we should consider how to question his conclusions. Does Aristotle's concept of the human telos ring true? What do we make of Aristotle's defense of slavery and the inferiority of women and foreigners? These are worthwhile questions for us to consider in our discussion of this text, and I look forward to talking it out with you all.